Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to SEO Gems, the most action-packed, information-packed course this industry has ever damn seen. I am so hyped to be dropping this for you today. This has been a huge amount of time in the making for me and it has taken me so long to put this together. I'm happy that I'm even recording this, that it's taken me so long to put all of this together for you guys. I wanted to make sure that I had the best ending for this year possible, considering my ending for last year was pretty shocking. Um, so I wanted to make sure that this year was as amazing as possible for you guys and that I am dropping some of the serious, most advanced heat that you guys have ever seen. Um, so stay tuned with me. Welcome to SEO Gems. This is gonna be a long one, so grab your cups of tea, grab a notepad, grab your iPad if you're using that to take notes. You are going to need it because this one is so full of information. It is insane. The next seven hours are going to be dedicated to dropping um, techniques, theories, tactics, and strategies that hopefully you have never, ever, ever seen before. So it's like I said, stay with me, get everything ready. Thank you for purchasing. It means so much to me that you are a part of my audience and that you've stuck with me over the years and that you've uh, and that you've trusted me with this purchase because I've really, really wanted to deliver for every single person who has uh, purchased this one. I know it was a big, it was a bigger purchase than I usually put out, especially this year. Um, so I wanted to make sure that this really delivered for you guys. Thank you so much. And just as a quick one as well, I want to quickly thank um, a few other people that helped with the creation of this course. Without these guys, this course would not be here. Um, so Nick Eubanks, Eric Lancheris, uh, James Dooley, Kyle Roof, and Edward Rostran. You guys have been fantastic and absolutely amazing. As well as all the guys that gave me reviews and feedback. Um, you guys have been awesome as well. I really hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you. So as an opening warning, this one is in no way, shape or form for beginners. You will not understand the language that I'm going to be using for the next few hours. So I would not recommend this be your first guide at all. If you haven't even got a year's experience in SEO, then this is really not for you. You need to be un understanding everything that I'm saying because I'm going to be delivering so much information in such a quick amount of time that you need uh, to be able to understand and digest it in terms so that you can process it and take it in. Otherwise, you're simply not going to understand and not be able to get anything from this presentation. As well as the fact that it's really not for pansy, white hat, Google pandas. You guys are not gonna enjoy a lot of the stuff that I'm coming out with because I do not give a fuck about Google's guidelines. So welcome to SEO Gems. This presentation is a three-parter. Um, this presentation does not include the bonuses, though we'll cover that in the next uh, bit. This is a one presentation, three-parter. So the first part is all about an introduction to the mon uh, mon modern money hat mindset. Part two is gonna be going into all the advanced SEO theory. Part three uh, is all about tactics and techniques that will make veterans lean in. That basically means that you're gonna be glued to your screen when I'm talking about the techniques and tactics in part three. Um, and take what you will, everyone is different levels, everyone's different stages. This is full of some serious golden nuggets. Um, so it's not all gonna to apply to you. Everything's not gonna fit your business model. Everything's not gonna to apply to you right now, but it might apply to you next year, it might apply to you in the years following. Um, you might be able to use all of these tactics, I don't know. I use all of these tactics, they work fantastically. Um, so let's just jump into it. Uh, the bonuses as well are the current and future state of SEO. Um, that's the first bonus. That one is potentially even um, something that you can go through first. If you wanna go ahead and just pause this video and go through that one, then you, then you totally can. If you're not up to date with all the latest news, all the latest goings on, um, and you wanna be caught up to date before you go through this, um, that's actually a, a pretty good one. As well as the fact that Elite Hour Analysis is another one that you could go through before this. Um, if you've been really affected by algorithm updates this year, that one is going to be your golden savior. Um, and White Hat Hacks, that's a PDF that's just a bonus add-on. It was gonna be its own product, uh, a very cheap ebook, maybe like $20, $30. So take it what take what you will with it. I am not a White Hat. Um, it's just a little bit of a bonus for everyone who wants some more White Hat tactics um, out of this rather than just covering all of the uh, grey hat and black hat stuff that I will be going over. 
So before we get into part one, where we go through all the theories that kind of give you that ah moment, um, we're going to be going through a few things that I wanted to get out of the way first, just to give you even more value, because I know some, because I get these questions a lot, I get a lot of stuff going on. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that you guys had all of these things answered first. Um, so just a bit of a story, a bit of a prologue to this. You can go ahead and skip this section if you really don't want to hear the backstory of this presentation. Um, as a bit of a backstory to this presentation, I wanted, as I said already, to create something for the end of the year that was very high quality, but I also wanted to create something that was really for the veteran audience. So the audience that has been with me, like I said, for many years, has known me for many years, has followed my advice to their own level of success um, over the years as well, and it has worked for them because it <laughs> because it does work. Um, and we'll be going, th and that's exactly what I wanted to give to you guys at the end of this year. The, the whole of this year, I've been creating a lot of content that is more beginner focused. Um, SEO Site Hustle has absolutely smashed it out the out the park, and I didn't expect it to do so as a beginner ebook. Um, and that's awesome. And I have got a lot of new beginners in my audience now, but I do know that I haven't been creating that level of stuff that I normally would be especially because I normally do it on my blog, on my YouTube channel, etc, etc, which are pretty dead at the moment, let's be honest. Um, I haven't been focusing on that at all. I've just been focusing on my Gumroad stuff. So I wanted to make up for all of the lost time over this year and create something that is going to just completely blow you away. So that is my entire aim of this presentation, is to just give you so much information that you are going away with not even knowing where to start because you have so many things to start on. That is my aim for this presentation. So I hope you enjoy it and I hope you get as much out of it as possible. Um, at the end of this presentation is my email address so you can always send me your feedback, send me what you liked, what you didn't like from this presentation um, and maybe even give me some ideas of what you had around the uh, theories and tactics and techniques that I am showing off so that, you can, uh, so that we can kind of explore them together and, and maybe even improve some of the stuff that I came up with. Um, so to start off things, I'm going to be taking a look at the veteran SEO tool tier list. I really like the tier list that all the YouTubers and stuff have been doing recently. So I thought it'd be a fantastic idea to put out a tier list of the top tools that I use in my toolkit. Um, I have basically half the tools on this list, either as a free subscription that the, that the companies gave me or I paid for them myself. My renewal fees every month are in the thousands of dollars now for tools. Um, it's that insane that I just have to have all that data and stuff. Um, I should really be looking at doing more deals with these companies considering the ones that I do pay a hell of a lot of money for. Though even AHF doesn't give free accounts for anymore. Um, so to start off with the S tier, we have Market Muse, the best content optimization tool on the planet. Market Muse got $20 million of VC funding um, at the start of the year and they have spent that money damn well over there in Romania. Um, they have been killing it with their NLP stuff. They're the only company that I know of that can actually uh, create AI generated content, like legitimate content where you input a couple of keywords and it gives you back something, that's insane. Um, yes, it's very expensive. It costs you like $100 per thousand words to get their AI generated content right now. Um, but it's freaking cool that they have it. And, and I'm not, I'm, because I've spoken to the owners, in the long run, they are looking at making that um, content considerably cheaper. So hopefully, in the next year, two years, three years, we'll be able to get AI-generated content from them that is of a very high-quality standard because I've gone through it myself. Um, it, it doesn't need much editing at all. It can be used as supporting content or, or link building content or whatever you want um, at a very high level. Um, hopefully, the next few years, it will be considerably cheaper or the owners did say that they're trying to put it into the subscription model so that hopefully one day you'll have like a credit system where you can um, get a, a set number of credits every month and you can just buy add-ons if you run out of them and you can get that content and that's all part of the subscription of the actual content optimization tool. Ahrefs, everybody knows it. Everybody should be using it. Um, it's like the best SEO tool suite in the market right now. Um, they just have the best data, the best filters, etc., and they're continually updating it with their crazy Ukrainian, Singaporean um, team. SerpWoo is just absolutely fantastic for algorithms. If you are affected or um, anything by algorithm updates and you want to be able to track all of the different changes over time, this is it. This is the this is the tool that allows you to see those daily changes of where sites have gone up and down um, for every single keyword that you have. And it's a fairly cheap model as well, so it's, it's a very good tool. Pitchbox is by far the best outreach uh, tool on the market. Um, it's 
got everything you need built into one platform. It's just pretty expensive. And they have that annoying thing where you have to do the consultation before you can just buy a subscription. I just want to be able to buy a subscription. Let me just buy it. Like it's freaking annoying when I have to phone people before I can just buy a tool that I already know how to use from YouTube videos. Um, Deep crawl is the best um, overall and enterprise level crawling solution. They cover every single uh, metric and thing that you can ever think of when it comes to doing it. The only problem is, again, it's very expensive. And if you have really large websites, unless you are dealing with those enterprise level clients that are willing to spend the uh, amount of money that it costs, it's going to cost you a fortune to crawl large websites. Um, Sitebulb is the best um, crawling, the best crawling tool that isn't enterprise level. It's like the, the best freelancer level one. And the fact that it also, if you're doing um, audits, Sitebulb gives you the hints in a very easy manner that you can export them or you can uh, teach your VAs to very easily know how to use those hints to implement it, it all. So you can theoretically be completely hands off from the um, complete on-page optimization element of a of, of a VA because they can do the be from the beginning to the end process themselves because the software teaches them how to do it and what to do. Um, and then seotesting.com, probably the most underrated tool in the entire existence of the industry and people don't even know about it even though it has an amazing domain name. Um, it's got testing for everything. You're probably thinking A to B meta titles, that's what I'm... Uh, that's what I thought of straight away before I even looked at it. But no, they do testing for everything. There's like a list of 20 different um, tests that you can run within your thing. That It's just fantastic. Um, it, the tests really depend on what you're doing. Um, so I can't be specific in you know how the use cases are going to be for you because they're so varied. Um, but, you, but it's super cheap. Again, the, the subscription is very low um, for what you get. And you can run so much stuff of it. Down to the A tier now, these are the ones that haven't quite made it to the elite, but they're still worth picking up the subscription for. Um, there's still some things that I would improve in them. That's the only, that's the only kind of caveat for why they're in A. Um, SEMrush, of course, basically Ahrefs, um, very similar. I would say that their keyword and on-page crawling tools are better in SEMrush, uh, but generally Ahrefs has more data, more filtering options, and a better UI. I am not a, I'm not a huge fan of SEMrush's AI. I'm not a huge fan of Ahrefs AI, to make that frank, but, uh, UI, sorry, but um, I am more of a fan of Ahrefs than I am of SEMrush. Um, I just think, and Moz is the least of, of my favorite. So in terms of UI, they have hardly any filtering options when it comes to like links and things, for example. Um, cognitive SEO, the second best, uh, content optimization tool on the market. The beginner level one, I would say Market Muse is more for the enterprise advanced and it's pretty expensive. It starts at $80 a month. Um, so you'd be looking at Cognitive SEO if you wanted to go for the lower end. It's, it's a lot cheaper. I think that's $19 a month it starts at. Buzzstream, the, the second best, again, outreach tool, doesn't quite make it up to the Pitchbox standards and Pitchbox's UI is so much cleaner. Um, Screaming Frog, again, a lot of people will probably argue with me and say that that's in the S tier and it's been, <laughs> I just think that Screaming Frog has been so embedded into the SEO industry that it's not actually that amazing of a tool and that it's actually um, more uh, just because it was one of the first tools out there and that they, I, it is amazing, don't get me wrong, it, it covers everything but I hate the UI, um, it's not the most simple to use, a lot of the settings are like convoluted and you have to go into like multiple uh, dashboards and like click around and stuff just to change one little setting. Um, it's really frustrating. So I, if, if they completely change the UI to be more like Sitebulb, then I would 100% be on board with Screaming Frog. Um, but they're not modern enough for them to be S tier, unfortunately. Little Warden, owned by uh, Dom, he, Dom Hodgson. He, this is an amazing tool. Um, the only problem that I have with it is that it doesn't monitor a few things that I wish it did. I already told uh, Dom about them though, so hopefully that will change in the near future. Little One essentially monitors your um, site in real time so that it sees any changes. So even if like a link changed because someone hacked your website or even if um, like a developer accidentally no indexed half your blog, like that will immediately send alerts to your email address, which is fantastic. And especially for clients that are really annoying about telling you things or clients that um, have annoying developers, 
that is going to be your lifeblood and saviour, trust me. Um, SEO tools for Excel, again, just an add-on for Excel. If you use Excel, you need this. I don't know why you're not using it. Um, Omega Indexer, the best indexer on the planet. I know the, uh, the graphic there, you can barely see the indexer part, but that is Omega Indexer. Um, it's the best indexing service and the only one that really works uh, speedily right now. Um, and it also works on maps. Like you can submit 10,000 URLs and they'll have it indexed that week. It's, it's at like a pretty high success rate, you know, 97% or so. It's really, really amazing. Um, Moz, B tier. Uh, I really, you know, their data still isn't up to scratch on some of the other stuff like the keyword tool in comparison to SEMrush or HFs. Um, their filtering options aren't as good as SEMrush or HFs. And it's all about the same price, right? So it's not really um, that much of a difference. The only reason I use... I still have a Moz subscription is to get data on top of Ahrefs and Semrush. It's not because I actively go there first. I never go to Moz first, which is why they're on the B tier. Um, Surfer, the best, um, sorry, the, the third best uh, content optimization tool. It's purely from a perspective of um, they need to do more updates. Like Cognitive SEO and Market Muse especially are significantly ahead of these guys. Um, though I know that Cognitive and Market Muse properly use um, NLP technology to, that, that is actually based on Google's technology to actually interlink topics and give you like topical com competitive scores and all this crazy stuff. Um, Surfer doesn't do any of that, which is why it's not up there with those guys. Um, SEO Power Suite, B tier, it's, it, it is worth buying because it's a one-time subscription and it has all of these awesome tools and you can have like a desktop rank tracker and all this stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, but again, it's not up there. It doesn't have the databases that AHFs or SEMrush does. It doesn't have all of the um, additional bonuses that, that AHFs and SEMrush does. It's just that it's the one-time fee, which makes it awesome. That it's very cheap. Um, Page Optimizer Pro Pop, basically in the same league as Surfer. They're very similar tools. Um, not much difference. They just generally give you different recommendations around it. Surfer is much more content optimization focused, and Pop is much more... Uh, on-page optimization focus. So it's much more about like the on-page factors, whereas Surfer is much more about the content factors. Um, but they're in about the same league because I've tested them both and they don't compete on the same level as Market Muse, unfortunately. Um, no, C tier, Raven Tools. Again, don't use them. Um, I've used them a lot in the past. I know tons of agencies that use them all day, all day long, but their tools are just not up to scratch with even Moz, let alone SEMrush or HFs. Um, SERP stat. If you're a beginner and you don't have much cash, then I don't know why you're reading this. <laughs> I don't know why you're watching this webinar, but uh, SerpStat is the one for you. And if you need to recommend a beginner version of AHFs to someone new who doesn't want to spend 100 or $300 a month on an AHF subscription, they can go and spend 20 or $30 a month on SerpStat and get something that is similar enough that it's going to train them to be able to use AHFs one day. Uh, RankWatch is, again, just a SERP tracker, and it does... It's basically, it, it was originally a SERP tracker that now does a bunch of on-page um, stuff, but it's not on the level of cognitive, basically. I think cognitive is a better version of RankWatch. Um, Word AI is C tier, but it could be, it's, it's the only one on this entire list that could be moving up. Um, that's it very, very shortly. That's because that version five of Word AI is coming out. And whilst the version updates in the past have been considerable, they're still not considerable enough to do what Market Muse does, which is generate AI driven content. And Market Muse 100% does that. Um, Word AI version five might do that. And it's a fantastic spinner if you're in generic, large niches that have tons of content that aren't technical uh, in the wording that they're using. If they're using technical wording, uh, Word AI fucks up big time. It can't replace the words. It messes up the sentencing structure. It can't do any of that. Um, so if you're in any kind of like scientific or technical niche that uses um, those kind of specific words, it really just isn't the, it, it's just not up to grade. Um, so that's the only reason it's a C tier and, it's, and it, it can be used to generate that PBN content and that filler and tiering content. Um, for most niches, just any niche that goes a bit too far, it's just not going to handle with. D tier, SE rankings. I know a lot of people love these guys, but like, I, I don't understand their tool suite. Like, I don't think it's very good. Like, their rank tracker is, is not very intuitive in terms of the UI. Um, it's also pretty bulky, so you don't get that much data. And it's the rest of the tool suite is just simply not very good. Like, it's, the rank tracking is the best uh, part of the tool suite. And that's saying something, you know, because the rank tracker should be the easiest part of the tool suite to make. 
Um, and then on crawl again, just a, a lower version market using cognitive. I wouldn't recommend on crawl versus those guys. And they on crawl also do like a bunch of server log stuff, which is really awesome. But unless you're doing server log analysis, um, which again is enterprise level kind of stuff, it's really not uh, it's really not necessary for you to for you to need it. Um, it's probably it's probably an A or S tier for people who are doing server log analysis every single day. Um, but for, for the majority of work and for the other tools that it has, it's just not really up to scratch. Um, ET at BuzzSumo, I don't really like BuzzSumo at all. I think the results it's giving are, are pretty crap. Like I understand that you can go through and very quickly find the top most shared posts, um, but why the hell would I want a tool that does that for $100 a month when I can do essentially the same thing with Google and a couple of browser extensions? Um, so BuzzSumo just isn't really... Uh, a tool that I use. I think that AHF's kind of killed it with their Content Explorer tool as well. So it's and the Content Explorer tool by AHF is pretty crap as well. So that they, they all seem to be pretty bad at finding um, really relevant results for what you're actually intending to do. Um, Longtail Pro, the worst keyword research tool on the planet. Um, it's basically an affiliate wet dream at this point because they run like 70% affiliate recurring commission so you want to uh, if you're a partner that is so if you're wanting to make a load of money then I'd recommend recommending like Longtail Pro because you can make heavy subscription return fees um, but again it's the worst one it doesn't incorporate any really new uh, stuff and they haven't updated that god awful logo in about a decade so definitely not going with that one and finally F is for content machine <laughs> these guys are uh, generating garbage like it's it's not good maybe it was fine to use 10 years ago 15 years ago um, but it nowadays it's, it's really just not up to scratch in terms of how it's um, generating its content word AI kills it in comparison and uh, even word AI isn't generating good enough content to put on the tier one right so it's um, it's it's just completely the bottom there for the F tier so in terms of actually building websites, what is the pack that I use to go out and build websites? This is my best site building pack for 2020. Obviously, next year things may change with new products or updates coming out to the market. But so far, these are my best recommendations. So I either go for a fresh or an aged domain. And if you are in uh, foreign niches, expired domains are now probably dead. And we'll talk about this later on. So you do not want to be using expired domains in foreign languages. Um, fresh or aged domains are the way to go. Fresh domains honestly work very fine. It depends on the niche, obviously. If you're going into a really highly competitive niche, I'd go for something that is aged, already has links, non-dropped. Um, but fresh, honestly, if you can build your uh, trust and your really, really high quality backlinks and all your content and stuff from day one, um, it's going to set you up for success, right? You're, you're not going to have to run into any potential issues that that domain has had with previous owners. Um, I then use Elementor Pro on WordPress, obviously, with various add-on packs. Uh, I use like four or five different add-on packs for different things. Um, Elementor Pro on its own is phenomenal. You don't need to get add-on packs, but they are really, really good uh, for getting different kinds of things and making sites looking really unique. Um, Cloudways hosting is just by far the best hosting on the planet. You can um, choose who you want to go with, where you want to go with, server locations, everywhere. Um, you know, you can use Google Cloud, Amazon Cloud, you can use whatever you want with them. And it's a fairly good billing system. It's not too expensive. Um, I use Rank Math for the WordPress plugin for the SEO stuff. They're the best WordPress plugin on earth. Yoast is just not up to scratch and is having far too many bugs. And their team are not the most fun on Twitter. Uh, WP Rocket and Short Pixel are the two speed optimization plugins that I use. My friend and I did a load of tests on uh, plugins and Short Pixel just wins. Um, Optimal also does really, really well. Um, the only problem is that they uh, incorporate their own CDN. So you have to buy Optimal, whereas Short Pixel is uh, a one-time fee. I think Optimal is a subscription. Um, Optimal and is, is actually the better image optimization plugin. The only problem is it, it uses its own CDN, right? So you can't use another CDN on the site, which is uh, not the best for me because I personally want to use a different CDN to what they're offering. And now for the current top vendors, I'm not going to be putting uh, a massive list here because I don't want people going off buying with someone and then coming and emailing me. These guys fucked up my link on it. Look, it's 
not anything to do with me. These are just purely recommendations. Um, but number one, SEO Butler, the nicest people in SEO. Uh, Jonathan Keatbush is the best person to work with ever. He will make sure your order is phenomenal. He makes sure it is perfect. Um, as well as the fact that they only use UK and US content writers, and I mean that they only use US and UK content writers. They are really, really good content writers as well. Um, your guest posts are going to have really good levels of content on them versus a lot of people just using $15 per thousand words uh, content. These guys are using you know, British and American writers to write genuinely good niche articles for their guest posts. Um, the same with their content, like they have a phenomenal content ordering system and probably the best content. It's, it's quite expensive for what it is, but you can get good uh, sales and good discounts. They run them throughout the year and you can also speak to them about getting bulk discount rates for agencies as well if you run your own agency. Um, get me links have the best link packages. I don't recommend their other services, but I recommend their packages because you're getting such a good discount on them. Um, you know, you can pick up links for $100 a link for you know, DR30 niche edits because you're DR45 niche edits, etc. Um, because you are um, buying the, them in a package. Gary offers a really phenomenal deal, as well as the fact that if you buy some of the higher end packages, um, they'll also give you free phone calls so you can get additional advice, a secondary SEO basically going over your site and looking at um, the links and looking at where you need to potentially go wrong. It's just always good to have someone else look at the site, especially if they're building the links anyway and you've ordered um, them off them, then you're going to be revealing the site anyway. So you might as well make sure that they they know what the site's about. They make so that they can match the, the best links to that site as well. Uh, Gabriel from Undercut Digital has the best niche edits um, in the world, basically. He's the only niche edit provider apart from me last year when I used to sell niche edits uh, was who does the um, traffic checks, which basically means that you're checking to see if the site has been hit by any algorithm updates or been um, hit by any manual penalties even uh, recently. So every time before you put the link live, you actually check that domain in Ahrefs, in Semrush, etc., and check for any wild um, traffic swings. If there is wild traffic swings and they're not positive, then we don't place a link on them. Um, that is the rule. He's the only person that I know that follows that, which basically means that you're not going to be getting dodgy links all the time. Uh, Serpwolf, by far the cheapest niche edit provider um, in terms of quality links out there. Again, I'd speak to them directly. I wouldn't order through um, like Conquer or whatever the fuck they're selling on. Uh, I don't like the fact that they use those platforms to sell. I would rather have it uh, that they have their own platform that you can order from because I think that um, when you're buying their package links you're not really actually getting the best links that they offer um, and you can get the best links they offer for a hundred dollars for hundred fifty dollars that kind of thing they're really cheap um, but again they don't do a lot of the traffic stuff they don't do um, they only started doing AHF metrics after I asked them to do it and it took them months to do it um, so there's a lot of issues there as well I wouldn't recommend tier wanting a lot of their links uh, just make you can use them as a tier two fantastic though Otis Global for domain names the best domain name provider in the world um, Alex Drew I've actually been buying domains of him for many years prior to um, Otis Global even being a thing um, he has some uh, he has the best domains out there period they do amazing research as well as the fact that they give you the monetization methodology on the domain listing page so you can actually see uh, potential ideas for what that domain can be monetized for um, as well as the fact that you can see all the other metrics as well but that, that monetization methodology is really really awesome when you're trying to find domains to purchase so finally we can actually get into seo gems part number one by far the smallest part though um, we're going to be talking about the money hat mindset and all of the things that come with it the definition of money uh, money hat, how to deal with um, the headaches of algorithm updates, as well as also my personal mistakes in 2020 that should be learning opportunities for not only me, but for you as well. So let's start off by talking about money hat as the or as a or as my definition. Um, I actually know the people who came up with the term money hat. It was a long time ago um, and it was in a very weird chat group um, don't know exactly who specifically came up with it, um, but I have used it for many years um, to great success. And I and this is my definition, and the definition is actually based off of what they were originally uh, talking about and thinking of. So, curious and educated across the board. This basically means that you are curious about every single type of SEO. Um, you're curious about every single 
piece of news, every single piece of update. You are a knowledge and educated SEO. You are going into every instance of carrying out optimization work or carrying out a campaign or carrying out a strategy with an educated overview because you have that curious nature of being able to go out and find information or learning it all from me. Um, so utilizing the best technique for the highest ROI. This is very, very, very important. Um, you essentially don't care about what the uh, technique is. It doesn't matter if it's white hat, it doesn't matter if it's gray hat, it doesn't matter if it's black hat. Uh, the technique that is going to be the highest return on investment in that specific scenario is going to be utilized every single time. Um, it's because you want to be getting the best amount of money. If you're going out and spending $1,000 on backlinks and you have the opportunity to buy three high authority DR70, DR80 kind of style links versus 10 or 20 cheap PBNs, I know what my bet is going to be. Um, so you're basically putting your highest ROI foot forward, making sure that every single um, time that you're doing it is going to give you the most amount of investment, your highest return. Um, so analysis first, implementation second. This basically just means that you're not going to, unless you're doing testing, obviously this is different to implementation, um, you're going to be analyzing everything that is happening first and then seeing again what the highest ROI, what the best implementation is for that anal analyze scenario. Um, I do not do implementation first. I do not go in and um, look at a website and start changing the mess title without first analyzing and having an understanding of the entire site. Um, I want to be able to know and have an understanding of the entire campaign before I do the an action, even one action, you know? And I know that may be frustrating to clients, and I know that may be frustrating to agencies that are trying to sell to clients, um, but it's the way that you're gonna get the best results and the highest ROI. And we are all about the mindset of having ROI first. Um, so money hacked as a mindset. Google is not the freaking damn internet police. They do not have any say when it comes to your business. As long as you are not doing anything illegal, their guidelines are not illegal. You can spam all you want. You can do whatever you want. You can um, have uh, any ability that you want, as well as the fact that who is it uh, for Google to set out a baseline recommendation of rules for a service that you did not even sign up for. Um, you have to opt out of this service. You cannot sign up for it necessarily. You have to opt out of it, um, Google that is. Um, so who are they as a corporation that has done many, many questionable things? Who are they to say where the ethical boundaries of the internet are? And who are they to set rules for their um, for a service that, they, that you have to opt out for? Um, it's all up to you. I do not personally believe that you should listen to any of the rules or laws or guidelines that Google is coming out with. Um, Again, you can have personal ethical debates on Google stuff, but generally most SEOs understand that. Um, the personal ethical debates are more around your niches, your job choices, um, the offer opportunities when you're promoting affiliate offers. All of that stuff is really um, important. And I know it's your persona. It's you as a person decides what you want to do. I personally won't do things like animal testing. Um, I won't do anything... Uh, anywhere near that level of stuff. I'll do gambling, I'll do payday loans, I'll do all of that stuff because I think that adults who have an informed decision should be able to um, access the market as they wish and please. And I think they should be able to do anything. I, I, I'm, more, I'm more so of a capitalist um, in terms of my own personal ethical debates. Well, I believe that all drugs should be sold on the market free. I believe that everyone should have access to whatever the hell they want. Um, Aside maybe, you know, lethal firearms and things, um, se severe, you know, bazookas or some shit. I don't think uh, most people, especially from where I'm from in England, should be accessing a bazooka. Um, but again, it's just personal ethical boundaries. They're very important, but it's your mindset and it's completely up to you as a person and, and as individual what you do and where your personal boundaries are set. Um, and as I said earlier, ROI first, always. It's all about ROI. Money hats don't really um, see SEO as a business. It's more of an investment. Um, you're investing each time you're carrying out even a task because you're investing your time. Um, so 
people don't track their time and the amount of time that they're investing into projects because that also counts into your ROI. If you have gone and sold an affiliate site for $100,000, congratulations. Um, but if your profit on that $100,000 is say $50,000, uh, for the last two years of work and you've been working nine to five every fucking day on that affiliate site for the last two years. Um, I'm sorry, you just earned 25k a year. That's really, really a bad return. Um, it, it's all about where you're going to get the most amount of return from your investment. And if you can, you want to be doing those extra little bits and pieces to get the most ROI out of your investment. So adding on extra things, you know, pixel data, email lists, these things add extra value to your assets and make them even more, um, even more valuable when, the, when it comes to sell time. So by far, probably the most stressful part of being an SEO, maybe aside from dealing with annoying clients, is dealing with algorithm updates. Um, you're wanting to just stay calm whenever there's an algorithm update. If it's if you've been tanked, stay calm. If you've gone through the roof, stay calm. Um, emotions really do cost money when it comes to algorithm updates. And if you're changing things in the middle of an algorithm update, um, that's even worse. You're even more likely to go down because Google's going to be all over the place with what it's actually reviewing and changing. Um, don't just analyze your own site. Again, look at all the competitors. That's why I would recommend a SERP for you earlier. It's a really good tool to see who went up, who went down, and then you can try and correlate things within your niche. Um, that is significantly better than just looking at your own site and trying to correlate off of one site. Um, and then build an algorithm update network. Basically build a network of SEOs, a network of um, business owners, network of friends, etc., who understand uh, the algorithm and who have websites or have um, clients or have a hold in the industry um, so that when a big algorithm update changes, you can go to them and swap ideas, um, swap um, communications, swap videos of, from other SEOs. You can, it, it really helps to have a network of people um, every time there's an update that happens just so that you can go and ask questions to people rather than being that annoying guy that tweets John Mueller. Um, so my major mistakes of 2020 were... Uh, only a few. There wasn't actually that many in comparison to last year where I made quite a lot of them. Um, not chasing money was quite a big one for me and it's still something that I don't do every year. I need to continually chase invoices, chase that kind of stuff because my accountant doesn't do it um, and I don't think any accountant does normally unless they're a bookkeeper who works for you. Um, you need to be chasing your own money, following everything up. At the end of every year, I normally do a analysis where I go through and look at all of the different affiliate offers and all of like the different random stuff that is just collated and invoice that haven't been paid, all that kind of stuff that just hasn't, um, that I haven't withdrawn or haven't followed up or haven't chased over the year. And I did it for this year. Um, and at the end of 2020, I found nearly $16,000 in cash that was unaccounted for. And that's a huge amount of money that I can be investing into uh, projects for next year. So I've managed to get maybe 50% of that so far, um, but it's still a huge amount of cash injection that you can have as, because it's pure profit basically at this point. Um, not investing in nofollow link diversity really cost me. And I think, I don't know why I didn't do it because I said it in May. I didn't, I, for some reason, I, I analyzed the algorithm update in May, did shit loads of analysis and then I think that just burned me out and <laughs> I didn't actually implement a lot of what I, I even talked about in May um, and especially I didn't put a, a ton more focus on the no follow links and that is something that was a major factor in the May update um, so it's something that I really need to be putting more time into um, and just making sure that I have a strong no follow link campaign and it's something that we'll be getting onto later on anyway um, so not diversifying niche income streams again um, all my eggs, all my eggs in one niche uh, monetization basket. I have a lot of affiliate sites in the travel and finance niches. Those would probably uh, make up like eighty percent of my entire portfolio. Those two niches, um, and obviously travel just got nuked at the start of this year. Um, and after I had a bad ending to last year, just for my um, a lot of my affiliate sites to get hit because of there being no traveling. Um, really cost me a lot of money. So I, me not diversifying my niche income streams really hurt. And I think it's something that you guys really need to be looking at. If you're trying to just dominate one niche, it's a bad idea. It's a, it's a good idea if you have other niches that you're in. But if you're just in one niche, 
um, make sure to diversify because this year more than ever has proven that you don't know what can happen to industries. Um, and then in not, not enough folks on retargeting. This is something that I really should have picked up on. Um, I don't even retarget the ads for these courses, let alone like my, a lot of my affiliate sites, um, which really probably would have seen a significant cash injection if I did. Um, so the fact that I didn't focus on retargeting and the fact that I didn't, um, because it's so cheap right now, you can do impression-based retargeting, which basically means um, that you're paying per thousand impressions, but people only know your brand. These people have already visited your website, so the likelihood of them to click on your ad again after already knowing you is so much more higher than if you're just doing a normal ad that your cost per impressions can be a dollar, two dollars, and you end up getting a hundred clicks off of a dollar, two dollars. It's actually that crazy. Um, so me not putting enough focus on the retargeting aspect, especially because I'm generating so much of this organic traffic, um, was really quite silly of me this year. So I think next year I'm really going to put a focus on retargeting or potentially even partner with someone who's just a really good um, ads guy. Part number two. So this is where stuff gets really exciting. We can start diving into some advanced SEO theory, start coming up with some ideas, start stealing some ideas and expanding on them from other SEOs and start making sure that we have a uh, idea of where SEO is heading, what kind of um, what Google is up to, all the different kind of stuff. So what is the basis for all of these theories, all of my theorizations? Where am I coming up with this stuff from? So it's either from testing where I have single variable tested things. Um, it's from research where I've just stumbled across things in the SERPs um, and it's from networking. So it's from talking with other SEOs and just bouncing ideas back and forth. Me and Dooley go through stuff all the time together and, and really bounce ideas off until we kind of have an exact um, idea of what it is between us. Um, and these theories, they can't be proven or at the very least without like direct information to from Google themselves, or just a ton of cash, which I am not spending on on one test. Um, when you know you can kind of have an idea of, of if it's real or not. Um, but of course, you need to be taking all of these theories with a grain of salt. Um, everything needs to be taken with a grain of salt here. It's not one hundred and ten percent fact. These are theories, after all. So one of my first theories and one that comes from having years and years and years of experience with these algorithm updates is that Google actually sets yearly trend targets of what they're trying to achieve with these algorithm updates. Um, so essentially what they have is they, at the start of the year, they probably get together in their uh, meeting, probably their first meeting of the year, um, where they go through all of the ideas, all of the suggestions, all of the stuff that they are trying to target. They set the overall goals of the company of that year that they're trying to target within the algorithms, but they also have other feedback from the people within that meeting. So my theory is that essentially at the start of the year, they have an overall trend uh, that they're trying to achieve or overall trends um, that they're trying to achieve by hitting certain targets. Um, for example, as a very basic example, they might say that PBNs are a target, or they might say that specifically all of these foreign SEOs using expired domains in PBNs are a target, which has been a target this year um, throughout many updates, but they've only really successfully achieved hitting it at the end of the year, which is this update. Um, but we'll get onto that later on. So at the, at the, this is why I also say that you can generally set um, your goals. And that's why I messed up in the May update, because that was the first big sign of no follow updates, uh, no follow links, sorry, being more important. And that was something that trended throughout the year um, from the May update. So again, I think that, and the May update was the first big one. There, there was an update in January, but it wasn't very big. It didn't really affect much. Um, and I think that was probably just a, uh, either a delayed one from the year before or, or, um, just minor tweaks to get the year rolling. Um, so the actual end, uh, so that's why exactly, and how can you use this theory? That's the main point of these theories, is um, that you can find the trends that Google have been going after from the first update of the year. It might take you six months, you know, for the for, to get that trend data, but then you have the next six months of being able to optimize for exactly what Google are trying to achieve with every update. And that's why when I go and look at sites that I have optimized, and I did put a lot of effort into um, a couple sites from the May update, all of them have done phenomenally well in the December update because it generally, though it might be um, having overall uh, different effect, generally the targets are the same throughout the year. You know, you don't generally see uh, major differences. Like that's why Penguin and Panda were rolled out in completely different years because of the scale and differences between a content and a link update. 
So theory number two. Google absolutely loves Twitter, and this comes off the back of Google shutting down Google+. Plus. I think Google, uh, Google's failed attempt at a social network re- made them even more reliant on Twitter um, than they were before. I think that Google has an innate kind of hate towards Facebook, so they really don't want to give Facebook any benefits. And as you'll see with algorithm updates, especially in the December algorithm update, Facebook lost Twitter a massive winner. Um, Twitter and YouTube, in fact, a massive winner because those two services are now the only real-time indexes inside of Google. So that essentially means that whenever Google is um, looking, so sorry, whenever you upload a YouTube video or whenever you send a tweet, Google in real time gets that information and indexes it. That does not necessarily mean that it does the same thing as the Google Search Console submit tool, uh, which is obviously no longer with us. RIP, probably never coming back. Um, it's actually a. It just means that that's page, so the YouTube page or the tweet page gets indexed, um, any links from it still then get added to the crawl. So it's, it's, a, it's the only real-time crawler, let's say. Um, so Google has seen that page. It's the, only, it's the only time that you can use it. So if you're not um, implementing Twitter into your strategies, I think it's one of the easiest way to get links indexed. It's one of the um, easiest way to send social signals. And Twitter uh, does have a minimal effect on search rankings. Tweets and things do actually play some level of a role. So theory number three, actually the most up-to-date theory, because this one only comes from about a week ago. Um, Google, in the latest algorithm update, so the December core update, um, or the Christmas update, as I've been calling it, um, Google killed expired domains in foreign SERPs. Essentially, what they did, and this is actually taken uh, not from my own research, but from Eric, from My Traffic Research, a good friend of mine, and uh, a community that I highly recommend checking out, especially around algorithm updates. Um, he suggests that Google has, in fact, targeted different TLDs that are outside of the uh, CCTLD range. So it basically means that Google has um, come after domains, and bear in mind that this doesn't mean that foreign is non-English, because it can include dot ie, dot ca, etc. And the reason behind this is that Google is only an ICANN registrar. So that basically means that dot com, dot net, dot org, etc. All of the American only USA TLDs, um, Google can register and can control and look and, and go through the records, etc., etc. It has it has the um, privileged information from ICANN, um, whereas. Every other TLD, it's not a registrar for, so it's not a registrar for Ireland, it's not a registrar for um, Canada, etc., etc. You can't go and get those domains. I think you actually can now get .co.uk domains from Google. Uh, I'm not 100% sure about that. Anyway, they're having problems, they're having major problems with foreign. Um, this has been going on for years now. It's actually, I did a post about it, I talked about it in my channel my SEO presentation two years ago. Um, I, I did a really popular blog post on DFY Links a couple um, years ago that, was, that went down very well about how you can dominate foreign with English links. Um, and obviously, this is a uh, target of that, but also foreign PBNs also influence English SERPs. So .ies, dot, uh, are used, whatever, I've seen it all, all of them uh, ranking English sites. And obviously Google doesn't want to penalize sites that are um, actually legitimate foreign entities that are linking to you. Um, so what they're doing instead is they're coming after just blanket banning uh, or blanket um, removing the juice from any domain that has been re-registered or has dropped and has not got a new site on there. Um, obviously, we don't know the specifics of what they're targeting, but it basically looks like if you have re-registered an expired domain, built a PBN on it, then it no longer will re- it will no longer will pass juice. Essentially, um, unfortunately. So, good luck to everyone else, uh, uh, anyone out there who is using foreign expired domains as PBNs. Unfortunately, they may not be that much influential for the foreseeable future. So theory number four, this one is that Google are using attributes uh, to train the algorithm. And what do I mean by attributes? That essentially means the rel sponsored UGC and no follow links that you see on pages or that you even use on pages. Um, and these are being used as a way to identify the positioning of those links. So that you can use to identify the position of where sponsored links, such as ads or just direct sponsored links uh, are being placed, as well as the positioning of where UGC links are being placed. And they're using that to train the algorithm um, to 
understand the positioning of links, understand why links go where, the content surrounding them, all of that kind of stuff. You can learn a lot from having uh, different links attributed to different things and, and knowing that those links are specifically attributed to that. Um, this also might be the reason why we are seeing sponsored links still pass juice, right? So this is the reason why um, Google is allowing sponsored links to still pass juice, um, essentially because they wanna see what kind of an effect those links have um, on the end result because it makes it a lot of it easier on the link graph to not just suddenly make major changes without seeing the effects of those changes. Google is all about cause and effect. Um, they want to see what the effect has on their changes um, and if it's a good one then they'll keep it, if it's a bad one then they won't. Um, that's generally why you see a lot of the spam and stuff in the SERPs from adding updates quickly removed because they find the common denominator of a problem within the SERP. And my final theory before we get onto all of the different techniques and tactics that we can actually be using where you'll be uh, actually implementing some stuff into your strategies. Um, this theory is also one that you can actually implement. Um, it's just still a theory and the end result of what you'll get is also a theorization. It's not um, an actual uh, number or a statistic or a fact that you're going to get to that. It's all about analysis and, and, the, and the estimation. Um, so basically, my theory for number five is estimating your links uh, return investment via backlinks gap analysis. So number one, you really, really do need experience for this technique and for this theory. Um, you cannot carry out this theory without being able to properly understand the return uh, you're going to be getting from the inputs that you're going to be doing. So basically... The, R the actual ROI is also much greater. Um, we're also only using averages for this, whereas you guys deal in months and actual money. Um, so we're going to be estimating the traffic that you're going to get to a page based on the number of links that you're going to be putting to it and the cost of those links and see what the ROI potential for the investment of those links is. Um, so first of all, you need to understand link gap. You need to be able to know that this isn't a one for one. This does not mean that you are going to be building um, a backlink and getting a one for one result and it's not guaranteed methodology as well you're not it's not guaranteed to get that result you might get an opposite result if you've done something uh, that's a bit of a mess up along the way so now it's time to start doing all of the math stuff to get the actual final equation done so we're going to be looking at a link gap plus link cost versus the potential returns so first of all you have to find your link gap um, versus the number one, number two, number three, number, et cetera, competitors. And that's uh, totally on you. I'm not going to be doing a tutorial on how to find link gaps. There's tons of them all over the place. And AHFs even has a tool for you. Um, you can then calculate your cost plus time for building links in the link gap, which I normally add on 5% to that. Normally just because uh, whatever you think the link is going to cost, even if on the website that you're buying links off of, it says it's $250 per link. Normally there's extra cost, extra time, et cetera, that is added onto that. So I normally add on 5% anyway. You can do 10%, 15% if you want to. Um, positional potential traffic returns. This is basically estimating how much traffic you're probably going to get um, from ranking in the number one spot or the number two spot or the number three spot. For example, if you have a uh, 10,000 monthly search keyword and you rank number one, you're probably going to get about 6,000 visits per month to your site from that keyword. Obviously, it's a massive how long is a piece of string question and you should really be looking at... Um, uh, your actual potential traffic returns, which is based on normal data. So essentially, you're looking at your uh, number one keyword and you look at, uh, sorry, sorry, you go into your niche, you look at a page that's already ranking number one for a keyword and see how much traffic it actually gets based on your Google Search Console clicks. Obviously, you can also look at impressions to make this even more accurate to then work out how many impressions you're getting versus how many clicks. But also bear in mind that impressions also take in, into account bots and other things that won't click on anything in the SERPs. Uh, every time you're putting a rank checker on there, that counts an impression. Um, so then it's as an example for this, if you had the 6,000 uh, traffic a month, like we said, off of that keyword, and you had a 3% conversion rate and the average profit per sale was $20, you'd be looking at 180 sales uh, for ranking number one for that keyword per month, and you'd be looking at about $3,600 per month in profit. Um, so if we actually work out our link gap costs, here's like a random little example. Let's say our top three um our top three positions looks like this in terms of link gap. And I've purposely made number two have more links 
because the link gap might be more, but the quality may be lower. Bear in mind that link gap is, again, is not one for one. The quality could be different. The um, niche could be different, all sorts of things. That link is not an exact match link. You need to make sure that uh, the, the quality of links is consistent within your link gap as well. So the number one top, let's say they had a 14 link gap and the cost was $3,500. Let's say number two was a 20 link gap, but the quality was way lower. So the average link cost is way lower. So it's $2,500. And then the number three is a five link gap, which has higher quality than number two, but they're $1,250 cost. Um, so our potential returns for each of those positions. Um, again, looking at the 10K a month keyword for this. Number one, it was cost us $3,500 to build those links. Um, but if we got to number one, we would get a 6,000 visitors per month. And again, at the uh, conversion rate of 3%, $20 profit, that's $3,600 per month profit, um, which gives us an annual ROI of 1,135%. So if we rank number one for a year from those links, we get a ROI of 1,135%. That's a pretty awesome ROI considering... Um, <laughs> you only invested $3,500. Obviously, these are all hypotheticals and you need to go and apply this to your own uh, niches and your own keywords and everything. And of course, if you want to take this to the next level, what you can start doing is looking at multiple keywords, multiple competitors, and what the overall potential of return for an entire link building campaign would be. So part number three, we have made it to the main bit that all of you have been paying this money to get to. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the rest of this stuff so far. This bit is gonna be where all of the real techniques and tactics are for you. So just a bit of an introduction to this uh, part or this segment of the course. The more, uh, I just wanna give you a bit of a quote from Oliver J. H. G. Mason, who is another fantastic SEO. The more techniques you know, the faster you get at solving novel problems. So, uh, essentially the exact case. The more SEO techniques you know, the more tactics you know, the more opportunities and the more um, paths you have to succeed and the more uh, ways you have of dealing with certain scenarios. So f number one, follow along carefully. Uh, this is going to be covering a lot of information. You might get some things wrong. You want to be making sure that you are following my uh, ideas and examples to the T. Um, implement everything that is relevant to you. Obviously, things that aren't relevant to you, you probably still want to stick around and learn and understand anyway, just because they might become relevant to you, like I said previously. Um, and remember what might be relevant soon. This stuff, again, might be relevant very, very uh, near to you. So you might want to be using these techniques and tactics straight away in the new year. Tactic number one. Okay, so we're getting into the big stuff now. So we're going to be utilizing irrelevant pages and passing link juice to our target. We're essentially going to be using ideally 100% of the link juice from a page that has that is completely irrelevant and has completely irrelevant backlinks um, and we're going to be utilizing that as if it were a niche specific page niche specific backlinks targeting our money page powering it up 110% so how do we do this so if you were to do a 301 from an irrelevant page with irrelevant backlinks to a uh, to another page on your site internally of course it's an internal 301 um, what would happen Probably you're either going to go down because the, the links are completely irrelevant and so is the page and so is the 301. Um, you might see some positive movement uh, or nothing's going to happen. Likely the third thing because generally Google devalues the links and so, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but generally, if you're trying to manipulate 301s, it doesn't really work like it used to a decade ago. So step one, how we're going to use this page that has irrelevant backlinks pointing to it to bolster another page on our site that has got, uh, that is totally relevant to our niche and that's going to actually make us some money. So step one, we're going to update the, with new content. So we're going to make it a bit more relevant. Uh, we're going to make it 300 to 500 words, normally by a bit more relevant. I just uh, try to put some of the niche keywords and niche wording into the content so it can uh, flow. If the page is completely irrelevant to your topic, then you might need to um, look at adding in 300 to 500 words um, to kind of merge the two topics together. So if you have uh, you know, a really random topic and a really random topic, you try and find some kind of synergy of how you can merge a piece of content together. That's when you uh, come up with the White House ideas. Though, theoretically, you don't need to update it that much. Um, you just want to be making sure that it's, a f uh, at number one, it's triggering the freshness algorithm update so that it's getting crawled and indexed and uh, it's, it's getting um, a fresh look on life. Uh, number and also it's getting a higher crawl rate and more 
micro budget assigned to it by Google. Um, and then number two, you're wanting to make sure that the page is actually has some relevance, right? So that it's not just a completely irrelevant page. Um, just more so for future proofing than anything. Um, set number two, you index the page, you wait for the relevancy of to update, and then you wait. Normally you wait four to eight weeks. Um, you can wait longer, you can wait shorter. I wouldn't recommend waiting too much shorter than that. Uh, maybe two weeks at the very minimum. Um, and then step number three, very, very simple. You canonical that page back to your target page. It's really that simple. Um, the link juice will flow from that page in almost a 100% manner from that first page that was completely irrelevant to your target page through the canonical. Done. It's really that simple. Um, the, um, the, now, the use cases that you can do for this are out the roof. Um, you can repurpose PBNs that are irrelevant. You can re and, and potentially even flow link juice from irrelevant pages that that PBN has links on to um, your actual post page where you are linking from that PBN to your site. Um, you could also do it with clients, where I said with the clients with the PR stuff. Um, you can do it with your own websites. You can repurpose domain names entirely if you do this um, on, on a grandiose scale. Um, there's many, many options uh, that I've done and that you can use this tactic on. Try it out. It's phenomenal. It works really, really well. Um, and it, again, it, it repurposes link juice that you didn't think you'd be able to utilize. Tactic number two, and time for a bit of old school stuff that some of you will remember my presentation from all the way back in 2014 when I first released my own Parasite SEO presentation at the Linkdex conference in London. Um, this one is because, para this tactic, sorry, is because Parasite SEO has changed. Um, and essentially what we're going to be doing is only using Google's own properties to say safe. So let's start off. Penguin hit parasites really hard. When the rolling Penguin algorithm update came out and um, a couple of years ago, it really hit, hit parasites. And when the original Penguin algorithm came out, it really hit parasites as well. So when you are uh, carrying out these kinds of parasites, it's no longer the case that you're going to be opening up GSA and spam blasting a fucking BuzzFeed page anymore. Um, that's not really the case anymore. And often with the with Google's own properties, you don't actually need to build links whatsoever. They Google just favor their properties that much, um, that and, and it's, it, it must be illegal, right, at this point, <laughs> from how much they're favoring, and you're gonna see why in a second. Um, but yeah, so we're gonna be staying safe using Google's own properties, YouTube, My Business Website Builder, and Blogspot. My Business Website Builder is um, something that nobody really knows about for some reason. Um, but if you are in the local SEO space, it absolutely dominates. Um, as you can see here, it is killing it for a ton of different keywords. And the last, the latest algorithm update from the December 2020 algorithm update actually had a massive effect on all three of the websites that I mentioned here. Um, you'll see you'll see that YouTube went up. Uh, it actually gained like a 70% visibility index gain. My website builder went up. Blogspot went up. Everything went up. That was Google's own properties. It's pretty obvious that they treat their own properties better than they treat everybody else's. Um, so you can dominate local uh, and they dominate in updates. As you can see from the latest December 2020 update, this uh, my business site has scaled through the roof. It's now number three for scrapyard near me, which is a gigantic keyword. Um, this in this site doesn't have any backlinks. Really, it has one historical backlink, which was a automated generated one. Um, and then it, it's just generally ranking off of content and the very easy uh, on page that they've done for it. Note that the actual site itself, um, so the like meta title isn't really that optimized for the keywords it's ranking for. The other stuff isn't really optimized that well. It's just the raw authority and the relevancy of that kind of stuff ranks really well. As along with the fact that the business dot site websites, anything that is like near me related, um, because it is automatically somehow linked to your Google My Business listing, uh, it automatically kind of embeds. Um, it, sorry, it automatically makes that website significantly stronger for near me keywords and local keywords because it actually localizes the business dot site websites because they are GMBs. Um, they're, they're just like an extension of your GMB. It's a service that Google offers as an extension to your GMB. So it's the only way that you can theoretically link a website 
and a GMB um, without ever verifying it in, inside of Google, right? So that's the reason why it absolutely dominates in these local SERPs. And if you're looking to take over or start a new local business, I highly recommend you just go down the route of a business.site domain um, because it's going to rank very quickly, very easily. It doesn't take a whole lot. And if you start putting some links on it, that thing flies. Okay, so tactic number three, one that is probably used more so by the PR people, but um, I, I still don't see SEOs incorporating it into their strategies. Um, maybe it's just because they don't know what to do or how to uh, implement it or how to carry it out for their niche. Um, but I think it's a really, really interesting tactic. I and mean, again, it's one of the more basic ones, one of the more easy ones, probably one that you potentially already know, um, which is unlike most of the ones in this presentation. So we're going to be ranking link and ego bait. Now, LinkedIn ego bait have been a uh, around for a long time. Um, they just normally you create, you know, normally the pieces of content around them are ego bait is aimed at getting like social shares and shares around the blog post and um, also just creating networking connections with uh, normal people. And then link bait is more targeted around trying to create content that will gain links. Uh, it's you know it's baiting links basically. However something that they don't really go into is actually ranking those link baits and ingo baits so that you can uh, get links on autopilot. So basically, when people, bloggers, journalists, etc, etc, um, are trying to find these pieces, it makes it as easy as possible for you, e even not uh, journalists and bloggers, even other industry folks. This is another thing that we're going to touch on next. Um, so the easiest way to get links, it's, it is the easiest way to get links. It's also on autopilot. Um, number one, you want to rank for people's names. Something that I do quite frequently is I create an industry database where basically what you do is you get a list of like, say, the top 100 or the top 1000 even um, people in your industry. You then create profile pages based on like a URL hierarchy of a database for uh, each of those people. And then without even building any links or anything like that, it should automatically rank for their name normally because there's not many pages about people uh, in not niche industries around uh, at all. And then the second thing is ranking for terms that journalists and bloggers search. So this is uh, terms that they will be searching for uh, to link to specific pieces of things within their content. So uh, the Reese, the journalists and bloggers normally search for things like statistics, numbers, facts, data, reports, findings, events, calendars, and calculators. All of those uh, kinds of things where you're creating a piece of content, for example, about SEO statistics or the SEO findings 2020, SEO events 2020, et cetera, et cetera. You're creating these pieces of content. Bear in mind that you can no follow any external links on the pages so that any reciprocal links are uh, follow, your, follow your way and no follow against the uh, person that is linking to you. So basically creating pieces of content around these things and then ideally trying to rank those pieces of content. They gain links like crazy. I have some statistics pages and I have some uh, calendars and events pages that literally gain 10 to 20 links every single month. Good quality, high quality links on autopilot. It is crazy. Um, and then you want to be doing, again, a best blogs list every single damn time. Glenn from Viper Chill absolutely smashes this with his detailed.com site. He creates lists for pretty much every top kind of blog out there. No follows all the links. Uh, puts in a load of extra details about those blogs. And then the amount of reciprocal links, as you can see here, is just phenomenal. He's got 219 referring domains on his top blog post. His tech one has 119. His crypto one is 100, uh, sorry, 120 on his, crypt, on his tech one, 119 on the crypto one. 110 on fitness, 110 on finance, et cetera, et cetera. And there's only 50 blogs he's listed, right? So the, the fact that he's getting double and quadruple the amount of links that he's linking to just shows how strong of a, fa how strong of a technique this really, really is. Okay, so tactic number four. We're going to be taking the absolute piss with image and infographic link building in this one. I'm sure that some of you actually may have heard Craig talking about uh, a slight variation of this tactic before. So we'll talk about that at the end. But this tactic um, definitely is really easy. Uh, we're going to start off with the white hat version and end with the black hat version of this because there's two variants to this. Um, so... We're going to be starting by creating new image content because creating new image content is great. It hasn't ever been seen before. It's not been indexed. It's really easy to reverse engineer your images and find websites using them so you can contact them to get links, etc., etc. Um, when you create the new content, 
piece. It doesn't need to be niche relevant. It can be creative. You can use locations if you're a local business or if you uh, have an office within a specific area. You could use seasons. Uh, for example, Christmas just coming up around the corner. Trends, massive local trends, uh, cyberpunk just coming out. You could make something to do with cyberpunk. Any kind of image that is going to be heavily used by, and bear in mind, it does not need to be niche relevant websites. It just needs to be a niche relevant image so that you have niche relevant um, posts that are link or niche relevant pages, sorry, that are linking back um, from the image. Then you need to make sure that your file name is um, ac an accurate description, but also uh, a keyword research file name. So obviously, if you're trying to rank for SEO keywords, for example, you can maybe put SEO office photo as your file name, .jpg, for example. Um, and then you want to upload via albums to large websites like Flickr, or you want to upload the individual images to free stock image websites. Um, that's just basically so that people can actually find your images and use them, because that's the entire point of this. Um, they don't necessarily, again, need to link straight away. You can go and ask them to update that link a little bit later on. Okay, so let's take a real-world example of this in action. Do you notice anyone hmm, in the background there? It's Mr. Matt Diggity. He uses this technique all the time to get white hat backlinks for his diggitymarketing.com site, but he also uses it for his other affiliate sites as well. Um, he uses it really, really well. Um, so as you can see, here's a picture. This is with Pete from ABC, the uh, co-owner of ABC. This is actually in Chiang Mai, where I am right now. Um, and all they did, as you can barely see, was draw a load of SEO uh, words and, and things on the whiteboard. Took a picture from the other side. Um, HD camera, uh, DS, DSLR, though, you can use a brand new iPhone, brand new Samsung, etc. The, the camera quality is good enough in HDR. Um, you take the picture. And then you basically upload it again to the stock, stock image sites or the uh, free album website so that it gets found easy on Google image search. And then what happens to that image? It's used by dozens of websites. And this real world example, Matt's real world example, is used off dozens of websites of one singular image. And who cares about domain relevancy anyway when you've got pages with good RD, good uh, DR, etc., good traffic, all pointing back to you. There's a, there's a couple DR, there's a DR70, DR50, DR90s, a couple DR90s and a DR20 there. So it's pretty impressive that Matt's been able to achieve uh, this much with it with the images though what you can also do which is what I was talking about Craig's technique earlier is you can use images that just straight up aren't yours um, so you can reverse image search images that aren't yours email them out basically saying that they it's, it's illegal for them to use the image it's copyrighted blah 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 unless they link to you um, and obviously you don't own that image but it still works and it's not actually illegal to claim that you own something when you don't, as long as it's not for fraudulent purposes. Um, so, you can always do that. You can always do that strategy as well. Bonus tip for everybody else as well. For some reason, I don't know why they do not do this, but most people don't scrape uh, for expired domains from infographic websites, which is one of the most fantastic resources I have been killing it with my scrapes on for expired domains. Um, so basically, all you're going to try and do is find expired domains with popular infographics. Um, that gives you free content because you get a free infographic to use, potentially even more than one, if you reverse engineer um, the domain to find that it has more than one infographic. Um, you get free content from the a niche relevant domain that you saw already, and you get all the links that come with it from the expired domain as well, if you're using that for a PBN or a 301 or whatever the case is. Um, bear in mind that you can also use the tactic number one on this one, where you can use... Uh, kind of semi-relevant domains to make them more relevant via canonical text. Um, so this is a fantastic resource. If, you, if you're if you into domain scraping and you're scraping dom expired domains, make sure that you're adding infographic websites to the list. It is a phenomenal way to get a ton more expired domain names. Tactic number five. So this one is pretty simple. Um, I think that probably most people are going to know this. I just bet that most people don't actually implement it, um, nor do they ever use it. So it's something that I use pretty much every time that I am trying to uh, redo the on-page of a piece of content or I'm trying to do a new website in a niche that I haven't really done much research before. So let's jump over to my computer quickly. Okay, so the tactic here is extremely, extremely simple. All you're going to go and do is put in your major keyword um, or a major keyword into Google. Make sure, of course, you're using incognito, not signed in, potentially even if you're not in the same country that you're targeting, a VPN um, and, and a, uh, non, like, a non a cookie-less browser. Sorry, a non-something browser, a cookie-less browser. That's what I was looking for. Um, and you're going to input your major or main keyword. It should give you something like this, so Sofas UK. 
then all you're going to do is go to the bottom, which is the related search terms, and you're going to look for stuff that is related, basically. Um, so Google here, apparently to Sofas UK, thinks that Sofas for Sale are related, corner sofas. Um, Ikea, DFS, SES, and Next are all brands, so you want to completely ignore branded search terms. Um, but you're going to look for stuff, essentially, so like corner sofas is one, sofa sales, Comfy Sofas UK. Um, and then let's say we went to Comfy Sofas UK as a really good example. Um, this one gives us even more stuff about comfy. So we've got deep comfy, big comfy, most comfortable sofa views, etc., etc. And it's giving us all of these uh, words that we weren't going to use before, both within our content, within our uh, link building, and potentially even within our sub pages of that main page. It's probably the best way to do keyword research without using any sort of a keyword research tool. Um, and you can just keep on going like deeper and deeper, literally deeper and deeper. I'll go to deep uh, comfy sofas and look for oversized, um, most comfortable, etc. just keeps on coming up. Um, and then for some reason, couch seems to come up. Um, maybe there's a potential market for Americans in the UK uh, that are searching for couches um, as well. So there's a ton of stuff here that you can actually go through and uh, look into. You can also look into overstuffed as a potential keyword for a, another page. Um, but yeah, there's, there's tons and tons of keywords here and you can basically just keep on expanding, expanding, expanding without ever having to do a keyword research uh, via a tool. And I, and I quite dislike the tools as well. And, don't, and also remember that if you're using a fresh installation of um, Chrome or using a fresh Firefox, then you can always get the uh, Google Chrome add-ons to show you even more data like within the SERPs around keyword volumes and keyword CPC, etc. with the keywords everywhere uh, add-on finally came back to me. Um, so these all are keywords that you really should be looking for and, look, and looking out for. Whenever you go to uh, do your keyword research, this should be pretty much the first step to try and find major uh, semantic keywords. Tactic number six, and it's actually something that I already shared at the um, Chiang Mai SEO 2019 event. It was one of the last slides in my presentation from that event, and it went down phenomenally well. I had a lot of people, even after the event, um, messaging me online about it, and people at the event all going a bit crazy. Uh, no one had really seemed to think about it, no one had used it before, um, and I don't know why. Um, so, and, and, and I am honestly surprised at the fact that uh, no one has ripped the <laughs> ripped off my presentation from last year and made their own post about it or made their own video or whatever. Um, I'm surprised I haven't seen it more in the wild. Um, like I haven't really been seeing it at all in a lot of competitors and stuff. And I actually know some competitors of mine were at Chiang Mai SEO, right? So it makes sense to uh, that that somebody would have implemented it, but I haven't seen it yet. So it's really interesting to me. Um, and really surprising that this one hasn't been showcased too much shot quite yet. So the tactic is extremely simple. Once they accept the guest post, so basically once you are in the outreach email stage and they have accepted the fact that they're going to receive payment and they've accepted the fact that they're putting a post on their website, then you want to research the site's most relevant pages slash heavy RD pages to your guest post. Um, and then you simply want to offer in another email before you set the payment, before the page has gone live, uh, extra money to link from those other pages to your new guest post URL. I normally offer between $20 and $40 per internal link. I've gone as low as $5 before. Um, it really depends on the niche and, and the site owner and how much you're paying for the guest post first. Um, and also how much they know about SEO and how much um, they know of a benefit you're going to get from that um, from those internal links. Because if you can get their top pages, you know, if you can get a blogger that has uh, three or four pages with 200, 100 RD, that kind of thing, um, having those internally linked to your guest post makes that guest post infinitely more powerful than it was prior. Um, and if, you're look, if you need to research the other pages to get links from, Ahrefs Best Pages by Incoming Links tool does the job perfectly, um, especially for smaller sites where it's harder to um, access the sites with links. You can very simply sort by RD and then just go through and uh, find the pages that have the best RD to them and which is the ones that you're going to get the internal links off. Um, as, as well as the fact that it has a search feature where you can very easily search uh, a niche keyword to try and find niche relevant pages. If it's a bigger blog with you know thousands of posts, um, it's really up to you. It's, it's, it's just all about making sure that the internal link juice from those other pages with these 
um, with the RD to those pages actually flows through because at the moment a guest post on its own is only really benefiting off of the root authority because that site because uh, a guest post a fresh guest post normally doesn't have any backlinks any social shares any comments any internal links any of that stuff um, so making sure the internal links there makes that guest post infinitely more powerful as well as the fact that it actually just saves you um, it, it, it can potentially make that guest post seem less like a guest post it can make it seem more authentic the fact that it has these links to it um, the fact that the the site owner is showing Google that this site does uh, that this page does actually matter um, as well and like like I always do as well um, you can also buy a second guest post if you're really scared of a site um, I find that the Times where I have bought a second link from a site, um, that site has never resulted in any sort of a penalty whatsoever. Tactic number seven, and one that's just not very common knowledge uh, from what I know. So robots.txt files, I know a lot of platforms, things like Shopify, um, don't allow you to edit the robots.txt files, but they do allow you to have URL management and throw on redirecting plugins, etc., on the go. Um, so if you did not know, and most SEOs do not know, robots.txt can be externally hosted. So you do not need to host your robots.txt on your own domain name. Um, if it's hosted on another domain name, as long as the URL structure is right, which is the third point on this slide, um, it's going to be fine. The, the uh, robots.txt still works as long as it's externally hosted. All you need is a simple 301 of the slash robots.txt um, and Google still picks it up. It's crazy. Um, you can so so if you're using a restricted platform, if your client's using a restricted platform, if your hosting is being a nightmare, whatever, and you can't for some whatever reason edit that robots.txt, you haven't got access to the HC access records. Do not panic. Do not worry. You can always throw on it to an off uh, to an externally hosted file instead. As a little bonus tip to things that Google treats differently, um, Google also doesn't actually index hashtag URLs. So, you know, if you um, put a hashtag one, two, three, or whatever at the end of a URL, that URL parameter will not be indexed under uh, Google's own rules, basically. So if you're wanting to hide stuff, if you're wanting to test things, if you're wanting to give stuff that is just for users, and you don't want to go through all the headaches of um, adding it into your HD access or text and no indexing the page and blah, 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 you can very easily use a hashtag URL to test out stuff, send things to people or use dynamic pages without it ever being worried about it getting crawled or indexed by Google. And that is it for all of the tactics, techniques, theories, and all the other bits of bonuses and SEO gems that I tried to fulfill in this original presentation. There is just simply way too much to recap. We would be here for another 20 minutes if I was to recap everything we went through. Um, you're probably going to want to rewatch this presentation again just to make sure that you didn't miss anything. Don't forget the bonuses as well. There is a ton more content. This is not the end. There is loads more content there to be had and uh, tons more techniques, theories and stuff in those ones as well as more industry goodies for you to jump into. So I'd just like to thank you once more for purchasing this presentation. It means a lot to me, as I said before, that you trusted me enough to uh, come, in, come with me on this awesome journey uh, of SEO gems. It was a really, really um, action-packed webinar and I and the bonuses are only just getting started if you haven't even looked at them yet because you have a long way to go yet before your information overload journey is finished. If you have any questions about any of the topics in here, you can always email me at me at charleswake.co.uk. Try not to send like a list of 20 questions. I'm probably not going to respond to that. Um, but if you have, you know, two, three, four questions, I'll be more than happy to answer those for you. Um, just bear in mind that it is the holidays coming up as well. So I might not be here through uh, over the holidays as well. It might take me until the new year to reply to you, though I normally try to reply to everyone. Thank you once more for purchasing this. Enjoy all the bonuses. I hope you enjoyed all this and got as much outfit as I put in. Peace.